Um, uh, second to last of the uh, Center for Historical Research State Formations uh, events for 2013 to 14. Yeah, we will, I should actually have a flyer with the next year's events, uh, which may in fact, um, may in fact, um, we may just go crazy and invite the other person. Actually, Greg Anderson is talking to, to uh, Jim Scott. Oh, wow. Right now. Uh, he just said, uh, we've got to invite Jim Scott to come to this. Yeah, so, well, so he may be uh, coming. Um, it's my great pleasure, uh, great honor to um, uh, be able to welcome Greg Downs, um, who I've never met before. But I've had a great, had a great uh, well, less than 24 hours. Um, uh, Greg uh, is at the um, City College, uh, uh, City University, at Grad Center at City University of New York. Um, he did his PhD, started started at Northwestern, and then moved, migrated with Steve Hahn uh, to Penn. Uh, that would have been what about 2003. 2003. I was going to say 2004. I was That's pretty there. good. And finished up, finished up there in 06. Um, and his your book came out in 08, right? No, surely not. Uh, 11. Oh, 11. Okay. The book is uh, Declarations of Dependence with the Long Reconstruction of Popular Politics in the South. Um, this is on, I, I'm, I'm getting very heavy handed about this uh, of late, but Americanists, I'm glad to read this book. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to make a tiny commentary about what we've been doing in the last uh, events that unfolded in this room over the last um, uh, but particularly in relation to Gary Gerson, because um, um, Greg's book, um, which I would say, I mean, as what, from what I've read, the next project, of which this is a part, uh, the paper we have, Practical Freedom, Space, Sovereignty, the End of Slavery, uh, kind of embeds the transitional moment in his story. But Greg's book um, challenges Gary Gerson. Last fall, Gary Gerson told us that um, the state police power at the state level um, did not um, um, uh, suffer a defeat in the Civil War. In fact, the kind of hinge moment of the Civil War, the hinge moment of American political history is not going to come to the New Deal. And if you follow Gary Gerson's wider story, um, and the New Deal is a, a, a brief moment. The longer New Deal, running to, the, to 1973, shall we say, um, is a, is a, is a uh, a, a brief moment in a uh, states-based polity in the United States. Um, and so Gary s strongly argued uh, that uh, the Civil War is not a major inflection point. And this is where Greg um, is um, making an important departure in, in, his, in his book, uh, or where should I say restoring our common understanding that the Civil War is in fact a great inflection. <laughs> and so yes, you're, you're actually revising your vision. Um, and the Civil War is, a, and, and it, it rests on the experience and expectations of people for governance in their um, and governance, effective governance in their locality and expectation that governance comes from a central power. Um, so I, I just want to make that pitch and make that uh, you know suggestion to all the Americans in the room um, who are under my party that we need to uh, we need to all, including myself, read uh, his book very carefully and look forward with great expectations for um, for, for the book of which of which this is a part. And so we will quiz you on what the publication date is. And on that would be. I assume it's about three years from now. No, March 2015. Bingo. Okay, there we go. Um, do we want to go around the room? Let's do that. Because we aren't that many of us. Um, and uh, um, I will um, actually. I'm going to start here with Sarah, and we'll come around. Hi. Yeah. We met earlier. Yeah, <laughs> but no, introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Everybody okay. introduce yourselves to the whole group. Uh, my name is Sarah Paxton. I'm a first year in the history department. I'm an early Americanist with a focus on legal criminal criminal justice and violence history. Hi, my name is Sarah Van Bergen. I teach African history for uh, African American and African studies across the street, but Greg and I went to grad school together. Yeah. So, here I am. I'm um, Michael Martocchio. I'm the dissertation fellow uh, this year at the CHR. I'm actually getting my PhD at Northwestern. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. And in, I w uh, in, in early modern uh, European state formation. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, Ed, Ed Muir? Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm just a graduating senior at Ohio State University. I just saw this aid on the Thompson Library. Ah, 
Uh, I'm Mark Boonshaft. I'm a PhD candidate in early American history and the cameraman. <laughs> and the flyer poster. And the flyer poster. And I'm Lisa Severich. I'm a third year graduate student in the history department studying early American history. David Stebbin. I teach modern U.S. political and legal history here at OSU. John Brown, second year grad student in the history department, um, and I'm an African American historian with an emphasis on the Reconstruction, post Reconstruction, on through uh, the Depression. Uh, Joan Cashin, I teach 19th century U.S. history, social, economic, cultural, with an emphasis on the South and the Civil War. Josh Wood, first year uh, history PhD student looking at politics in the Northwest territory. I'm Dean Bannerstein. <coughs> I'm an early Americanist. Um, I study uh, zoos and zoology in the 19th century. I'm Hunter Price, uh, PhD candidate here in the department. I do um, early American religion and social capital. I'm Cameron Trotter. I'm a PhD candidate in history working on uh, native space and sovereignty in the uh, Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. I'm Cameron Zargar, and I'm doing Near Eastern languages and cultures. I'm Zach Fry. I'm a PhD candidate in military history. Um, with an early American minor, and I'm interested in this because I study the emancipation debate within the Army of the Potomac. Yeah. I'm Diane King. I'm one of the CHR fellows. I'm a cultural anthropologist and really enjoying being surrounded by historians this year. Um, and well, it's I work. Funny we're usually trying to get away from each other. No, no. It's, it's wonderful to combine the two. I work on kinship and state in uh, the Middle East. I'm Timothy Leach, uh, early Americanist, uh, second year doctoral student here, and I work on the politics of the Continental Army. I'm Chris, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology here. I'm Prince Brown, and I'm a retired professor of sociology. I do historical sociology in the area of African American uh, history and culture. I'm John Brooke, I'm in history, I'm the director of CHR, and I want to leapfrog over Brandon and <laughs> introduce uh, Erica Gilroy of the uh, Political Science Department and a member of the steering committee of this year's CHR, um, and uh, um, broadly uh, uh, what we we'll call a, uh, uh, a theorist. Struggle for words. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> <laughs> it is always fascinating to hear other people describe it. Student with sorrowful theory of political thought, and particularly American political thought. Yeah. Um, so now the floor is yours, Greg. And um, I'm going to get out of the way, and then you, the floor is yours. And so do I go first, and then you? I hope so. Yeah. You hope so. All right. So John had suggested I talk to you all a little bit. Uh, 10, 15 minutes is right, right? Um, an hour, two hours, <laughs> right, go back to the 19th century style, right? The, um, about you know, how I came to this, where this fits in the broader intellectual trajectory, both of the book, and then I'll also talk about where it fits in, in my uh, broader intellectual trajectory, uh, written, written largely. Um, so practically, this is a piece of, I decided, uh, perhaps foolishly, or perhaps, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, I extracted a piece of one chapter of the book and then attached it to a different set of arguments and ideas that I was playing with. Um, and then in the process, I either spared you of or deprived you of um, the, the bulk of the, the latter part of the chapter, which is about uh, the mechanic, mechanics of how this, uh, how this process happens. So I'll talk about um, that, and I'm glad to expand upon the relationship between this story and the Freedmen's Bureau, or um, some of the regional variations and so on, um, you know, uh, in questions. But where, what unites, um, I always uh, feel a, a moment of peril, you know, when somebody says, you know, what ties together your different interests, because I feel like I barely, I'm sure I'm the same person I was a week ago, much less, you know, uh, in September 2001 when I started grad school or something, right? That seems like a very distant person, one who got a lot more sleep. Um, but, um, you know, there are certain, you know, obsessions or eccentricities, I guess, I would say, more than clear standing political, you know, um, intellectual points. I had come into, uh, come, come into graduate school in history after having worked as a, as a newspaper editor and also uh, as a fiction writer. I had, uh, I had written a, published a book of fiction while I was in, in graduate school that uh, I had worked on prior to. And I was very interested in storytelling, but I wasn't that interested in especially, I wasn't particularly interested 
in the way the literary departments were handling storytelling. I was interested in the way that the stories that people told influenced um, their visions of, of politics. So I wasn't interested so much in stories as a, as a genre to study, um, as much as to see stories as a way of accessing how, um, for want of a better term, uh, people separated from you know, high intellectual or political circles to see how they thought and talked about the role of government in their life. And um, based upon, upon that interest, uh, and also, you know, which had been fed by both personal experience, but also by, which, uh, you know, I'll save you from, but also by um, readings in other fields. Um, and then, uh, you know, I got interested in asking this question about how we might understand at that level the impact of the Civil War, that um, rather than to ask, here's the set of uh, legal frameworks or policy or bureau frameworks that we can use to ask what had been changed and what wasn't, that could we ask how the Civil War transformed the way that people talked about the role of government in their life. Um, and that emerged as I started going through these uh, petitions and letters, especially to um, governors I chose in my first book, Declarations of Dependence, first history book, um, North Carolina. And so I was interested in the way that the kind of letters, petitions formed a uh, language of politics, and could that match up to um, other ways in which we could see stories told about politics and politicians and, uh, and sort of, uh, and this led me toward an argument in that book that you can trace a, sh a shift um, within, within North Carolina, and I think more broadly than that, but you know, that's the evidentiary base of that book, um, in the way that people appealed to the state during and after the Civil War, and that the presence, particularly in North Carolina, of a double occupation, of an Eastern occupation by the U.S. Army, and a Central and Western essential occupation by the Confederate Army, um, produced different um, expectations of government. Um, and also the sort of idea that North Carolina is a central home front, um, rather than until the very end of it, where on the eastern seaboard it is an essential battlefield. Um, and the desire of competing uh, sectors that are, that are competing for loyalty produce all kinds of um, government intervention to try and, and gain people's support, including very basic things, food uh, distribution. And that this in turn produced an expectation of government access. Um, that made government, that made distant, non-local governments accessible to North Carolinians, black and white, different governments at different times and to different ends, but accessible in a way that was hard to shake from popular conceptions of the role of the state. So that even if looking um, from a, you know, from a, from a top-down, from a policy viewpoint, if you looked and said, well, but those are wartime exceptions, and the state does shrink, and there's reason why people who, who look in that term think about the shrinkage of the state after the Civil War, um, but then it took a long time for that to spill out into the, into the countryside, for people to get shaken from their sense that they could call upon a government. They couldn't always get what they wanted from it, but the government had exposed itself to them. And that other forms of dependence, of attachment, of mutuality, um, which had existed on a social level in all societies, maybe in particular forms in a slave-based um, largely rural and agricultural South, but that are also part of almost all societies, started to be imprinted upon um, people's cl claims upon the state government and the, and the national government. And so that what I saw was that across different lines, people sought uh, what I call a form of patronalism, um, you know, which is that they sought to create and imagine a fantastic patron in a highly personalized uh, government, um, you know, personalized through big figures, whether governors, congressmen, even legislators, um, later in the century toward this fantasy imposed upon distant uh, presidential candidates. Um, and that what they sought um, as they appealed to them was to make sense of two propositions, both of which they understood to be true. The one of which is that they had, like all people, needs and saw themselves as uh, not as independent or autonomous from the state as sometimes American history can portray an ideal or a desire of Americans, but as people in need of help. And so in that sense that sometimes it, got, it has been interpreted by others as it's about the wreckage of the southern economy, and certainly that's a piece of it, but I also see this as beyond simply a story of, uh, of you know, the particular privations of the post-Civil War South. Um, but to say it, to ask the degree to which we've repressed the, the centrality of dependence in most people's lives, that most people uh, understand, especially rural and agricultural people, the need for outside assistance, and then in the fracturing of, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of, of social ties and in the expansion of the state, they saw in the state a way that they could reach out and create those, try and create those forms. 
of attachment so they could get particular things, coats, underwear, firewood, you know, anything that you can think of, people asked for. In unimaginably personalistic terms, literally underwear was not unusual for people to write to governors or, or even presidential candidates. Um, and that they then, but then they had to balance that need and that vision of government against a contrasting understanding, which is they were aware that government was retreating from them. And so what they invented, like the people in many other circumstances, but particularly tied to the forms of uh, democratic expansion in the post-Civil War South, um, was a highly personalized vision of government. I know that you can't send me, if you, I know that, I, that it, you'll tell me that you can't send me firewood, because if you do, you'll have to send it to everybody, but that's not true because I love you. And so a deeply, among people, they call you, you know, they call you governor, I call you friend, one thing people say, people who never met. Or the flip side of it that's related to this fantastic uh, transliteration, they call you governor, I call you king. Um, and a desire to create within an expanding dem uh, democracy. Uh, forms of, uh, you know, a kind of a good king thesis that we think of, you know, floating through parts of... Uh, of early European history, a vision of a king who's betrayed by you know, lower level people, but who will respond to loyal subjects. Doesn't mean that people saw themselves solely as subjects, of course, you know, they were glad to claim rights of citizenship while they're doing this, but that they're creating this, this messy mixture of a fantasy about state help, even as they're reckoning with the reasons why that's not operating programmatically. And this allowed me then to make some claims about why the 1890s and 1900s are such a transformation and such a puzzling one, um, because rather than to see it as a progressive expansion of the state, one of the things that I trace is how self-consciously um, progressives, at least in, uh, on the, well, both on the national and the state level, both looking at the early civil service reform and then reforms of pardons and other, uh, and other reforms at the state level, um, aim to rationalize the government by cutting, dissevering themselves from the people. Um, that progressivism, many people experience progressivism as a denial of a right to plea. Zebulon Vance, a governor and senator from uh, North Carolina, when he's arguing against the civil service reform, says the Constitution can say whatever it wants, but there are only three rights that an American has. And one of them is the right to beg. And civil service dissevers Keep this association. A million people may ask for the job, beg for the job. Only one may get it, but everyone has a sovereign right to be heard as they beg. And that progressive reform was an effort to dissever. This is be small p, you know, 1880s, but as a you know sort of a reform uh, movement that'll 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 flower at the state level in the, over the next decade. Is an effort to dissever. So then I also tried to capture the confusion and the fury um, that those reforms unleashed. And I also tried to talk about how this was a field of democratic competition, small d democratic competition. So that rather than purely um, to impose a color line retrospectively, you know, there have been portrayals of emancipation that portrayed some of these things as peculiar to emancipation. So then I argued that there's all kinds of interesting commonalities in language and vision among African American Republicans in North Carolina and white Democrats or white populists. They're appealing to different patrons. But at the base level, this vision of a conflicted relationship with government um, formed a kind of language base, an idea base that people then would apply to competing uh, competing patrons. In the, force of, in, the, in, the, in the course of this, I got increasingly interested in the interactive questions about what it is about government intervention that's leading to these uh, and the presence of the state that's moving toward this. And I also got interested in other kind of murky ways of mucking up the way that we think about the state subject or state citizenship relations. So I wrote a piece on and it, the importance of organic metaphors, why evolutionary ideas mattered so much to, uh, you know, and social Darwinist, well, you know, it would be called, you know, crudely social Darwinist ideas mattered so much to an upper class reforming elite um, because that it, by displacing those patron metaphors with organic metaphors about society, about the, the, the state-society relationship as a, as a single organism to be treated. And I also got interested in what will lead me into to this project in a series of comparisons that at first made no, that at first took me by surprise, which were comparisons of the United States um, post-Civil War and Mexico post-Civil War. Very widespread, uh, competing Republican and Democratic uh, uh, uses of this discourse. But they compare Mexico of the 1850s and 1860s, the Mexico that Juarez rose in, um, was deposed in by French intervention, and then fought back to control of, as a series of civil, which they domesticated as a series of civil wars. 
Um, and asked about the relationship between what you know might would get coded as Mexican warlordism and Ku Klux Klanism, um, as well as of centralization and military rule in Mexico and in the U.S. South, that allowed for all kinds of different critiques, um, and that I wrote up and came up came out as an article a couple of years ago, in 2011 or 12, um, a couple of years ago. Um, in the process of that, what fascinated me about that was the common invocation of something that made no sense to the literature and led me to hear, which is that on both sides, people would talk about the post-Civil War intervention on the ground in the South as highly intrusive. Um, and while this had been, and in celebratory terms among Republicans, not so much among Democrats, of course, this had been a piece of, for those of you in uh, Reconstruction literature, this had been a part of how Reconstruction literature had been constructed in the Dunning School, uh, the 1890s, 1900s, the Army of Occupation, bayonet rule. Um, but it moved entirely out of the field by the 1950s and 1960s, um, so that to the degree that occupation was invoked at all, it's a thing that didn't happen, the bell that didn't ring. So I got interested in that, as well as uh, other ideas that were circulating about occupation for obvious reasons in the current, in the current environment. And so I thought, well, I'm going to write about you know, why it is that they didn't run an intrusive occupation, but thought they did. How did they fool themselves uh, into thinking this? And I thought, yeah, I'm going to look up, and what I was especially interested in, and what I'm going to come back to after I'm done with this, um, was in understanding the, another set of comparisons they made, which was between the United States and Austria-Hungary and the, and the post-48 occupations between the United States and Algeria, India, and this international understanding of Reconstruction, very present in congressional debates and upper-level debates, that again didn't seem to fit with me. And I thought, I'll look up what all happened in the actual occupation, and then I'll be able to trace this uh, language of international comparison to show why they fooled themselves. And this book emerged because I couldn't do that. That even books that purported to be studies couldn't really answer basic questions about where the army was, what they did, how widespread they were, and questions that you would start with the basic you know, level question. How many people are they? How far outspread are they? How long do they stay? What legal powers do they have? And I couldn't answer those questions, and so then that completely reshaped the book that, that I approached. And so this is one section of that. What I do in that book, which is uh, called The Ends of the War, occupation and American Reconstruction, is to explore the extension of wartime post the surrenders and to understand occupation as an extension of wartime. So the first chapter that comes before where this is is about the rejection of the, of the armistice with the South that Sherman had offered and the sweeping away of civil law, a decision at the, by the cabinet and, and President Johnson after uh, Lincoln's assassination not to sustain local law or to sustain local courts and uh, state officers, but instead to sweep them away and that whatever people they chose to continue to work through um, were only in position because of their recognition by the army and to give the army power to select new people or to displace people entirely. Um, and so that is a striking moment that opened up all kinds of shocking comparisons, uh, you know, comparisons that struck me, especially with the uh, with French Revolution um, and comparisons that seemed totally out of keeping. Um, at the time with how I understood Reconstruction to, to, to operate. The second chapter then looks at having marched across the countryside of what are the next stages. And one piece of this chapter is about the impact of geographical spread, that having marched to displace civil governments, that the United States Army officers on the ground, many of whom are relatively you know, moderate or even conservative, confront a couple of things. One, the enduring disloyalty of white Southerners. And second, a series of complaints, first about the survival of slavery uh, from freed people you know, uh, running to U.S. lines, and then about the, de the particular limitations upon freedom, or a sort of not slavery, not freedom state that existed in places where, free, where slavery itself had broken down. And that this, I wouldn't say inherently that it radicalizes, but it transforms their sense of what the Army's job is. And so the Army stays in the field in the summer and the fall to hunt out um, that form of, uh, of slavery. Later chapters talk about the relationship, the endurance of those powers beyond places where we might think that they disappear. So Johnson appoints provisional governments, calls elections, and yet still empowers the army to overrule local law, to set up separate courts, to do military commissions. Um, and then uh, chapter four talks about the, how the army sustained this power in the face of one of the largest and quickest demobilizations. Um, the later, the second half of the book talks about what happens as Congress takes over war powers as they return in 18, uh, 1866, and then it argues eventually um, that we should understand what we call, you know, uh, congressional reconstruction 
as in large part an effort of Congress to sustain powers of occupation that they understood had been constructed by Johnson, but that Johnson was trying to let loose of. And to understand the importance of force in their understanding of how government at part was going to have to operate in the South, what it would take to uh, defend acquired rights. And that in that sense, the crucial question for them, um, as they struggled to figure out how to embed powers of war into peacetime through enfranchisement, but also through civil rights acts and constitutional amendments, the crucial question became when the war would end. And I argue that the war ends in February 1871. Um, and that it's not until then, it's not until the debates in the late spring and summer of 1870 that you can even see a preponderance of Congress willing to end war powers, though they're diminished and altered by 1868 to 1870. Um, and that the end of the war is an agonizing result, um, that it's literally, they get up and say, today the war is ended. This is not a sort of, I'm a huge admirer of Mary Dudziak, but it's not my effort to apply a retrospective uh, vision to it. And that it's agonizing exactly because they can't figure out how it is that you can embed enough powers in peace to sustain the gains that occupation has, uh, has gained, so that they're caught in this terrible dilemma of the only force that they believe that they can rely upon is a force that they don't believe they can hold on to. Um, I'll be glad to expand on any and all of this, but let me uh, turn it over. Okay, great. Um, well, you know, one always hopes that any extemporaneous remarks that a speaker makes before one comments on his paper will dovetail nicely with the comments one has prepared. And one doesn't always get what one hopes for. <laughs> um, so, um, so now for something completely different. Um, uh, Which is the, it's the design. It's the design. <laughs> it was, it's totally by design. Um, I asked ask Greg that his comments not dug him with my own. <laughs> uh, so as, as John mentioned, I'm a, I'm a political theorist coming from the political science department. Um, I'm somebody who thinks a lot about the history of political thought, and who spent the last more years than I care to count thinking about the kind of ideological history of the political use of the word freedom. Um, so the cut that I have on this paper is, is the paper is largely, as you know, about um, how the word freedom was used and reshaped during the period that Greg's um, studying. So the cut that I sort of have on the paper that I'm going to try to make here in my remarks has to do with what Greg has to say about the ways in which freedom language was used in this time and the way that he thinks it was changed um, during this time. Um, so I read the paper with a lot of excitement and with a lot of interest. Um, excitement because I think it does exactly what a paper like this should do, which is to show how the ideological categories that people use to kind of make sense of the world that they're living in collide with and then are sort of reinterpreted or transformed in light of the practical realities um, that they face. That's the excitement part. And the interest part, because I'm always interested and, to be honest, a little bit insecure about the extent to which what I think I know about the history of political thought, as I gather from the study of high theory, intellectual sort of discourse, and so on, maps on to the experience and the language and the understandings of the ordinary people. And you don't get much more ordinary than um, this wonderful picture of newly emancipated slaves reaching out to newly minted soldiers and who are far from home and trying to make sense mutually of the sort of drastically altered um, relations they stand in respect to each other. So I, I was very interested to see how that, what that sort of milieu or that sort of scene would have to teach me about um, what, I, what I think I know. Um, so my remarks are going to focus kind of pedantically, I have to say, um, on the following passage that, that comes near the beginning of the paper. It's on, it's on page two. Let me pull it up. Um, near the bottom of page two. Um, it's a kind of statement of methodology in a way. Greg writes that um, social movements rely upon teleologies of future progress to keep people hopeful. Scholars, however, depend upon shedding those teleologies, casting even metaphorically freedom as the place we're moving toward, either by our steps or through the pull of the river of time, so with a spatial and a temporal dimension to this, um, these, set, these metaphors, and I'll get back to that near the end of my comments. This makes freedom an end state, not a category of analysis. And skipping the parenthetical there, the march of freedom is problematic, not just because it is a teleology, but because the language draws us toward a thin, individualized, decontextualized understanding of the ideal, of the ideal rather than the practical meaning um, of freedom. So I found that passage puzzling for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, it sets up a distinction between an end state and a category um, of analysis. And it also sets up a distinction between, a, between an ideal and the practical meaning um, of that ideal. And neither one of those binaries strikes me as a kind of um, statement of mutual exclusion or as an exhaustive way of describing the categories. I would say that if people use, and you'll see my, my theoretical predilections here, I would say if people use the, the word freedom to describe an end state, um, which they do, um, 
then if we're going to analyze the category, what the category freedom means to them, we have to understand what they mean by that end state, um, um, why they find that end state attractive. And if we want to understand what freedom means as an ideal to people, then we have to understand what they think that ideal requires of them, practically speaking, and what practical means they see to pursuing that ideal. Um, so if they see <coughs> teleologically, whether it's strategically or not, right, then we have to either think teleologically or sympathetically inhabit a teleological perspective um, in order to understand what they're thinking and how their categories are working for them. I don't see those, again, as, as exclusive options. And that'll, that's not just a conceptual point. It's, I think, a practically important point, as I'll get to in a minute. Um, so the second and more important thing that I found puzzling about this passage is that um, the claim that teleological language, or the, the teleological metaphors you start with, the spatial metaphors and the, and the temporal metaphors, when quoting your paper, draw a sort of thin, individualized, decontextualized understanding of the ideal of freedom rather than the practical meaning. And I would have thought that the opposite was the case, that to the extent that we take a piece of ideology or an ideological term or a value, evaluative term out of the ideological context in which it carries meaning, um, that's when we end up with a thin, in individualistic um, view. And believe me, this happens all the time in the philosophical literature. Um, on freedom, we see words taken out of context and sort of analyzed as if they didn't have any kind of teleological meaning um, um, when they're used in context. So the thought here seems to be that if we place the realization of freedom in the hands of an extra human source, like God or nature or history or something like that, if we make it teleological in that way, then we encourage the thought that freedom is a non-political good or an extra-political good, that it's something that the state can only interfere with or take away or alternatively, that the state can only grant through a kind of act of abstention by staying out of things. Um, and that way of thinking um, was certainly abroad in the later part of the, of the 19th century. It's famously captured in the title of a collection of essays that Herbert Spencer, the great defender of laissez-faire, published in 1984, called The Man Versus the State, right? Um, and it's captured in the phrase laissez-faire itself, of course. Um, and that's a sen that, that way of talking about freedom is a central feature of, of market ideology, or libertarianism, as it calls itself um, now, which is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the last several years, which defines freedom as the absence of restraints on individual action, and of course, which relies on its own set of spatial metaphors, spheres of uninhibited action, or paths or doors that are open to us, or obstacles that confront us, or obstacles that work inside of our minds, or whatever, all is, you know, spatial metaphors that um, that this way of talking about freedom um, draws upon. Now, I take it that one of the goals of your paper, as far as it's an analysis for you, is to challenge that view, right? Um, which is thin and individualistic, um, and to show that the post war experience, and here I'm going to quote a series of passages from the paper, illuminated the deep interconnection between force, state force, um, and emancipation. That's page five. Um, showed that government defines the freedom not just of free people, but of all people. That's page nine. That freedom and unrestrained liberty are opposites and that freedom and order are not contradictory but complementary. That, those are both from page um, 11. I think that all those claims are true. I think it's important to be reminded of them um, in a time, in a week, when the president of the Heritage Foundation said, as you may have heard, that it wasn't the federal government that liberated the slaves, it was the Constitution. Um, but, and this is where I think I take issue with your paper, and maybe I'm wrong about this, I want to argue that that view um, about freedom, all those claims about freedom weren't discovered or invented during the Reconstruction period, but in fact they were widely held at the time and in fact are the dominant views about freedom that have been held throughout most of the political history um, of the West. And following a lot of precedent, I'm going to use the word Republican to describe the view about freedom that I'm talking about, even though I know that's not a label that a lot of the people who hold this view would have claimed for themselves. And I know this is a confusing word to use in a historical context where capital R Republican has a you know, particular kind of meaning. Well, for me, the word for, as a kind of holder for the, for the set of ideas that I'm going to describe, which I think do hang together. Um, so Republican freedom, and some of you are going to know this, um, consists at heart in the, in the absence of or in the control of arbitrary power. Um, and the paradigmatic case where arbitrary power is possessed and exercised is in the relationship between a master and a slave. Um, um, and so the idea here is that no matter how kindly a master might be toward a slave, or no matter how inattentive a master might be toward what the slave is doing, the, the, the mere fact of the master-slave relationship constitutes a profound kind of unfreedom precisely because the master could interfere at will, arbitrarily, in the slave's action whenever he, um, whenever he pleases. So it's the fact of dependence and not the presence or absence of restraint that's the kind of crucial um, factor. So it's a short step from that idea of personal or face-to-face you know, -face domination to political domination, where the tyrant rather than, than the master becomes the, the possessor of arbitrary power. 
But in politics, things get more complicated because politics is a domain of action where coercive force is exercised both by and over a collection of people, a political, um, um, a political group or polity. And so what does it mean to be free from arbitrary power in politics? Well, the short answer is that political freedom, political freedom in the Republican sense, requires that no individual or group, um, whether a minority or a majority, have the unilateral power to impose its will on the whole, um, on the whole, on the whole polity. And, and ensuring that that's the case is, of course, as much a project of restraint as it is of empowerment. Restraint both of other people and of oneself. Um, so Republican freedom has both an institutional dimension to it, right? You have to design institutions in such a way that nobody has that kind of unilateral control and a kind of ethical component to it. You have to cultivate virtue, as they call it, among people so that they're not disposed to abuse power or to seek power inappropriately. Um, and I want to suggest that those two sides of, intellect, of, of Republican freedom, sorry, the institutional side and the ethical side, give us access to the spatial and the temporal metaphors that you consider and reject um, at the beginning of your um, paper. So the, the appeal to the North as a space, or to Canada, as a space of freedom, right, or the, or the, the proximity to the North, the kind of proximity to freedom, seems a lot less mysterious, right, when we see freedom as a condition um, under which people, people's status as free is guaranteed <coughs> under law and secured by the active practice of citizenship, because law and citizenship are, of course, territorial um, phenomena, right, so we enjoy them by virtue of being in, this, in a particular um, space. And the more complicated, the more interesting thing, and I'll, I'll end with this thought, is that the temporal metaphors, the idea, as you very nicely put it, of the contrast between the slavery time and freedom time, um, calls in the, the concept of virtue, and calls it in a very special kind, a complicated kind of way. Um, and to make this last point intelligible, I'll have to test your patience a little more by, by bringing in one more feature of this Republican view, which is the claim or the view not only that virtue is necessary for the enjoyment of freedom, that one has to display or practice the virtue in order to maintain or preserve one's freedom, but also that freedom is necessary for the practice of virtue, that an unfree person will be denied access um, to virtue because the fact of being subject to arbitrary power has a kind of distorting effect on your character. You have to kind of suck up to or grovel before or scheme against the power that you're, that you're subject to, and you can't sort of be yourself and cultivate the virtue you're capable of. You become, as Republicans tend to say, servile or slavish in your own disposition. And that brings us back to the question of teleology in kind of an interesting way, I think. Because Republican political thought, as it comes down to us in the intellectual tradition, is teleological in a very funny kind of way, which is to say that it's all, almost always declinist. It's almost always a, 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 a view that holds that freedom as a kind of constantly monotonically decreasing um, quality um, over time. Um, Republicans tend to place the peak of civic virtue and therefore the most secure enjoyment of freedom at the moment or shortly after the moment when the Republic is founded. Um, and we see this trope, this way of thinking all over the place in thinkers who are different from each other in lots of other ways. Cicero, Machiavelli, Montesquieu, Rousseau, Hume, Burke, Tocqueville, they all have this kind of um, uh, um, declinist or, or fatalistic notion of what um, the fate of Republican freedom will ultimately be. It's a central trope in Roman political thought, which is constantly comparing the present moment to the ideal you know, moment of the founding, the present leadership to the heroic leaders of the past, and it's a central trope in American political culture where we're constantly and almost neurotically asking ourselves, are we living up to the ideals of the founders or are we betraying the ideals of the founders, right? Um, and what I think your paper brings out very nicely is the way in which slave narratives and emancipation narratives give us access to the progressive side um, of Republican ideology, which is, for obvious reasons, not the side that tends to come down to us from the more privileged intellectual um, tradition that I spend more time thinking about. On the side, again, the focus is not on the supposed absence of virtue among people who are disenfranchised or excluded from citizenship, but rather on the fact that emancipation and enfranchisement are a necessary condition for the cultivation of whatever virtue you might have or whatever virtue you might be um, capable of. And that contrast between the kind of declinist Republican narrative that I mentioned a second ago and the more progressive, emancipatory Republican tradition that I just mentioned still describes, I think, still the political narratives that the left and the right use to think about American history and to talk about American political culture um, today. One side sees a decline or worries about a decline of virtue in the citizenry or worries about the exercise of citizenship rights on the part, part of people who are unworthy and irresponsible with those rights. The other side worries about the corrupting influence of the fact that people are um, excluded from or vulnerable to um, the exercise of arbitrary power and therefore have a kind of you know, inability to display whatever virtue they might have. So you mentioned a bunch of book titles in your, in your, in your paper. One side of this debate gives us books like Slouching Towards Gomorrah, 
um, and the unmaking of America. Um, the other side gives us, books that I think you mentioned, the rise of American democracy bound for freedom and so on, right? But notice that both sides are teleological. Neither, you know, neither view is standard individualistic in the way that you talk about. Both treat freedom as a political project. Neither is willing to associate freedom either with unrestrained action or with the absence um, of order. And I think that dichotomous way of thinking about freedom captures, to accept that freedom is the, at the root of a lot of our ideological disagreements today, which I think it is, it captures the root of those disagreements better, I think, than the sort of negative and positive liberty line which we're more familiar with to think about freedom. So I'll stop there, make that a good conversation going, and I'll take the floor. I've been wondering about the debate in starts in late 65, and then Eric's, Eric's I think, uh, discussion, just something popped out of my mind. Uh, late 65 into 66, uh, about the, the where in the Constitution, I've forgotten, but it talks about the federal government shall support a Republican form of government in the states. Mm -hmm. And um, the interesting thing there is that um, they tried, they brought it up a few times, pre-war, and they never got it right. And then, um, and then it, it became essentially when, when the southern states were, were um, refusing, were you know, denying free people the right to participate electorally, that this language came into play in really the fall, the, the late winter, of, or the, the, the midwinter of, of, of 65 to 66. And I wondered how that, that play, you know, whether that sets things in motion for you or do you, do you talk about this at all in your... Sure, right sure, here. sure. Um, yeah, I actually think the fight over the guarantee clause, um, which emerges from this effort to claim ongoing federal power to intervene um, through a broad definition of a Republican guarantee, I think is a failure. Um, and it actually doesn't explain why the Republicans take the, the, the decisions that they make. Because they're quickly tied into knots um, the, the whole challenge of the Guarantee Clause is that it's fundamentally a peacetime power, which means that it's going to have presidential power. Presidential, not presidential, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and very quickly, um, able lawyers on the other side start saying, okay, well, New Hampshire bans Catholics from holding office. Can the government vacate their government? Um, and that the terms of a peacetime use of the Guarantee Clause, Democrats say, if you do this, that's fine, but one day we'll be in Congress, and then we're going to vacate Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Um, and that is a, and that kills it. Um, the late, at the, end of, at the end of the use of war power, see, what, at the end of the use of war power, 69-70, a few people try and revive it, um, but to very little effect. Um, and so I don't think, it's one of those things like territorialization that sort of floats out there. But it's not actually crucial to the, the kind of decisions they're making. The reason that they <coughs> believe, on the whole, that they can do this, and that they're essentially unrestrained, is that they're refusing to say the war ended. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that, that's what puts the pressure to extend the war to 1870, and that's why they can dismiss governments. Because they can't come up with a standard that would say, why can we dismiss the government of Mississippi for being white only, but that wouldn't allow us to dismiss the government of California for excluding Asians. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're tied in, in incredible knots over what would be that standard. So that's why I think these other things float up, but in the end, it's the war power that well, Congress relies on. That kind of enhances the, the wider, I mean, there is a big, there's a huge problem with the Civil War right now in sort of American, the problem of American political legitimacy, where we are going forward from the early 21st century. Which is oh, you mean now? I'm talking about now, now, and and the implications of this paper, which is that freedom and rights were enforced at the point of the bayonet, and you know that effectively, if if um, there, if the, I mean the problem here is if the Civil War was a great Cody moment of transition, um, that is a, a moment that was that involved the defeat of the White South. And we now know, you know, even more people die among the white southerners than we thought before. Uh, and it creates it creates a, a you know, ongoing bitterness. And how do we deal with this problem of, of legitimacy of the American polity when we are, you know, then the form of the moment is in fact the arrival of 25 Union soldiers evicting the the uh, elected or the appointed county officers and 
you know, Buncombe County, North Carolina, um, and uh, uh, you know that that effectively this this fundamentally important moment is also a moment of of the threat of violence, the threat of force. Now, the other way to look at this is, is that all rights are ultimately enforceable by force, but this is the baldest of force. Right? And, and I guess I, I keep worrying about the current condition, which is. Broadly, the white South, realist, really or metaphorically, the white South is does not buy into the legitimacy of the federal government. Uh, and, uh, um. I don't know. I just, I just worry about these, metaphys these large metaphysical issues about, about the nature of legitimacy in the United States. Um, if if, um, if you know, the fundamental and obvious rights um, um, are not, the, not based on consent in some measure. Uh, well, I think that um, I certainly don't have the, uh, you know, the answer to resolve, you know, uh, all of our present day <laughs> political uh, <laughs> the enormous uh, conundrum here. But, you know, in the boring way historians do, um, what I will say is that one of the interesting things about marching forward from, you know, combat war into this period of non-combat war is to understand the kinds of, that if, if, if it's not a test case for why we didn't get the desired society, but if it's a, if it's a test of people's responses to different moments, <coughs> that that conundrum mattered to people. Um, not just as a club to hit over the head of their opponents, um, but even people who were adamantly um, and wholeheartedly in support of constructing a system of rights were also, based on classics and based on reading of you know, Mexico and based on reading of other places, highly interested in the question of, which continues to be a dilemma in policy studies, how do you exit from a civil war? Um, and that absent, you know, this is one of the reasons why the end of the war produces all kinds of amazing um, ideas, many of which, you know, die immediately. One of which is, you know, reserve Florida as a, as a land, a self-governing land for African Americans within the United States, right? The, the others of which are about expulsion, but that's, you know, difficult to achieve and, and doesn't have much, uh, you're certainly not going to get Kentucky and Maryland's votes on expelling white southerners, right? Um, others of which go to all kinds of different ideas that start to circulate. Um, because they're trying to figure out how is it that you can imagine, can you build in enough rights and then restore normalcy? And if you can't restore normalcy, then will you ever be able to create stability? But they're very interested in the English Civil War for this reason. How do you stabilize society so you don't have a hundred years of civil war? Yeah. And if you, if you, how do you create enough stability to stabilize society without jeopardizing the rights. And what do you do if one starts to falter? And I would say that they end up at a set of answers that are deeply unsatisfactory to us. Um, but I don't think that they end up there because they don't care about the answers. I think they end up there because of, you know, human frailty and foolishness and misjudgments and then a lack of power once they return to peacetime. A sort of, you know, a, 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 unwillingness to face how much of their ability to remake the world depended on bayonets, even as they did it. Um, and so I don't think that they're choosing not to, to create that society as much as they're, they're themselves trapped within that dilemma. And I do think, I would certainly never argue, all right, pro possibly, I probably do in here, in which case I should not say never. I wouldn't in the future argue that it's the discovery of a new set of ideas. But it is the lifting up for people who had, you know, like, uh, you know, like all human beings lived in denial of things that they might have to admit. The war is a series of exposures of the nature of freedom um, that are not new in intellectual history, but are new in how clearly they are articulated. And you start to see this with the American Freedmen's Inquiry Commission as it goes <coughs> through the Southwest. Because a lot of the early debate is structured around sea islands. Um, and as they say very clearly, the Sea Islands cannot be the model for the rest of the United States because the masters left. Right? This is not, and they say then, Eastern North Carolina um, uh, can't be the model because the masters moved their slaves. So they said the whole model of how to think about freedom has been shaped by one area where you've got slaves without masters and one area where you've got masters without slaves. And they say the problem of what emancipation is going to mean is going to be what are you going to do with the regions where barring some unforeseen you know, mass exile of one or the other where you've got masters and slaves facing each other. And that to them is the Mississippi Valley. 
Right. Not just that it's much larger, but that it's the one place where they're encountering in, you know, in tax slave owners and ex-slaves face to face. And that leads the Inquiry Commission says, you know, we have lived essentially in the fantasy um, <coughs> that ending slavery means asserting freedom. But slavery is not just a legal status, it's a series of power. The only way to contest power is with power. And they then, after arguing a, a historical argument about the end of slavery, at the end, they nod toward in a way that embraces the sort of long-standing, but also perhaps in the popular political repressed vision, they say, while we've justified this in the use of slavery, it has nothing inherently to do with African American, with Africans, as they say, or with slavery. They say no human race has ever gone into the transition to free labor without the significant exertion of the police power. Mm -hmm. um, Charles Sumner picks this up, and he says, in the you see this really then emerging Congress in the in the in the 1864-65 debates, where. The Senate is picking up the Freedmen's Bureau, which had died, and the House is picking up the, uh, the 13th Amendment. Um, and as the end of the war is pressing near, the end is, as Lincoln is pushing, obviously, as uh, Spielberg, you know, reminds us over and over, ridiculously, the, uh, the 13th Amendment. The, um, the, there you see really a new level of precision um, about where Democrats start to wave around and say, in the 1850s, you said, all you need to do is remove slavery and freedom moves in. You said this. They quote people back to each other. And if that's true, why do you need a, why do you need a enforcement clause of the 13th Amendment? Why do you need a Freedmen's Bureau Act? The person, the person gets up and says, we need it because I didn't understand the power that slavery exerted, and I didn't understand the force of government. So I wouldn't say they're saying, I have made an intellectual leap. But I would say that they're saying that the war has exposed them to things that maybe, you know, if pushed back to their hobs, or, you know, they would, they would have acknowledged, but that they had lived in denial of. And that you really see this exposure of a self-conscious sense that it's going to require immense state intervention to create freedom. And that's where Sumner, who in, in some ways is blind to many of these things, but in, in this way is very astute, he says, you know, my freedom depends upon the, the, the sheriff of Middlesex County, right? All of us, all of our freedom, and we've known it, but we like to believe that it's a judge's order, but it's the sheriff behind him with the mace that has always defended all of our freedom. Where does he say that? He says that in the, in the Senate in, in debates over the Freedmen's Bureau, as the Democrats so are talking about. Like uh, this is like January, February 1865. Um, and this actually, you know, becomes repeated, uh, not exactly those words, but that idea becomes repeated. Um, that it's not solely a problem of the condition of freed people, it's a meaning of free people, is this what I argue is a newly self-conscious statism that the war produces. Um, and I think that some of it, I don't want to go too far, um, but I would say that I think some of it also can help us to understand the transition of people who seem ardently anti-slavery, um, but not especially institutionally oriented in the 1850s, who become some of the people who are the gravest disappointments to the Republican Party um, in 1865, especially Seward and Chase. Um, that both of them have this imagination, they retain this belief that for Seward you end slavery and freedom emerges. For Chase you end slavery and you extend the boat and freedom emerges. He literally says, and then we'll go home and we'll never have to do anything again. And it's this institutionally oriented understanding of freedom that embeds, ironically perhaps, often in people who were not before the war anti-slavery, people like Stanton, um, that is the one that starts to drive this policy of force out into the countryside. Um, and that it may be, you know, I would have to look more carefully at it, um, that there's interesting things to be said about those variants of, of the sense of freedom and force in the 1850s that can help us to predict Chase, I think, shocked, no one was shocked that Seward, you know, no one on the Republican side was shocked that Seward betrayed them. Um, but that we could have a broader understanding of why people become, abandon the cause exactly as some of the people who are seen as more conservative um, suddenly become much more procedural and institutionally <coughs> oriented and therefore much more supportive of intervention. Could I, could I add something? Because John, I'm glad you mentioned the word consent at the end of your original comment. Because I think a lot of the people who are not like uh, uh, the most radical Republicans view consent as a core principle from the founding, which means the coercive powers of the state can be small. And it isn't until the post-Civil War period uh, 
I mean, the initial naive hope on the part of a lot of leading white Northerners is that the Southerners will know they are defeated and consent to emancipation. But it becomes clear that they, do, they know they're defeated, so they consent to de defeat, but they do not consent to emancipation. Then there's this choice between core principles. Either we build a much more statist system and vastly increase the coercive power of the federal government for generations, potentially, until white Southerners and white border state people consent, or consent becomes the core principle, it continues to be the foundational principle for ordinary white Americans, in which case there's not much you can do. I mean, you can do a little bit in the short term. And, but I don't think that a lot of Republicans in Congress see the unwillingness to build a great big coercive state as a betrayal of the republic. In other words, they see consent as a foundational principle, and they're sort of stumped by what to do about white Southerners when they don't consent. And I would love to hear what you think about that. In other words, our whole system is underdeveloped for coercion. Right. And a lot of Americans are very proud of that Absolutely. when it comes to driving and everything else. In other words, it's the system is supposed to be based on the consent of the people. Right. Right? And so then what do you do if you believe in that, if that's a core value in this immediate post-war? Do African Americans who are free talk about it in that way? Do white Southerners talk about it in that way? That's a great question. I mean, certainly there's no question. There's a couple <coughs> ways that I'll try and, uh, and, and slip into it and then see if any of those are you know, get us close enough to the heart of what's a very big question. Um, one answer that never gains traction, though it's not inconceivable that if, if things had gone a little differently, it could have, is to declare certain people's consent as no, not worthy. Um, and there are, in the Wade Davis bill that passes the Congress and the um, Lincoln vetoes, um, they alienate anyone who does not, from that point forward, pledge loyalty. Um, and in that sense, a mass alienation um, it, it, you can, you know, it's easy to imagine all kinds of different outcomes of how that would have worked, but that's one way of saying who do we need consent from. Um, and there's an effort it does, it receives you know, overwhelming Republican support, but then they're not at that point willing to override Lincoln's, uh, when, well, they don't get the chance because he pocket vetoes it. Uh, but they wouldn't have been willing to override his veto anyway. But so there's certainly in Congress um, at least an openness toward exclusion of the people who no longer need, whose consent is no longer needed. And Stevens will continue, um, and a small group of radicals, and then, you know, will continue to, to probe that, whether there's ways to re-extend either actual alienation or a lifetime disfranchisement that'll practically remove people's, uh, you know, the need to obtain their consent. Um, but at the same time, there's also the thing that people understand is the dilemma of civil wars is that they can't be ended by a treaty, but they have to end on terms um, or they'll go on forever. Um, and so that they're very highly aware of, right? They reject the idea that surrender is a treaty, which, you know, is, is very widespread in the North by the winter of 1864 to 65. Um, but they're very attached to the idea that there has to be a kind of mutuality to end the war or else it'll keep resurfacing. And that's what then leads to what to us and to some of them look like fictions, right? You know, if you pass, well, they never say if you pass the 14th Amendment, you'll be restored, but they imply it. Um, and then, you know, if you pass the, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you're newly established um, constitutional conventions that will require a bayonet to enfranchise free people and disfranchise certain confederates, pass through certain things, and they create a society that can give consent but they also increasingly recognize by 68, 69 that that society can't sustain itself, right? They get overthrown, A, that they're demographically outnumbered in most southern states, and B, where they aren't, they get overthrown. Um, and that's where you see a real agonizing at the end of this transition from, from war to peace, which is there by 69 they really have to face that the states that they've set up can't sustain themselves, except they hope in South Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, the places that have very, very large free, po free populations. But they've accepted, accept is the wrong word, but they have been faced to acknowledge that there's not a strong enough white Republican base for them to be able, for free people to be able to make alliances that will hold any other state. And then what do you do? And you see an incredible, you see both a sort of acquiescence you see people looking to still figure out how through the series of civil rights acts they passed in 1771 can they embed it into, into local systems in a way that you know, will force the local law to change, 
it turns out that that doesn't work. Um, and you also see for the first time a real group of Republicans start to say, maybe we should extend war forever. Right? If this is the force, they lose, right? You know, if, uh, but you know, if this is the, the ultimate question, um, then, then maybe we've, maybe we've got to be willing to, to keep fighting. Um, and those are very subconscious arguments at the end. Um, so I would say that they're highly aware of those problems and unable, essentially, to figure out the solution, especially as they start to ask, pass the 15th Amendment, you have the Enforcement Acts. But very serious legal thinkers who are supportive of enfranchisement say, and then when the people gather around the polls and don't let free people vote, then what are we going to do? Can we really send people in everywhere? And in fact, in 1870 and 71, Republicans passed bills to allow military intervention. But there's always this question of, what will happen if the local whites have so much authority that they both resist it and are able to resist the terms and resist them the practical consequences? They're going to keep testing it, and eventually we're going to come up short. And that, in that sense, they're right. That is a kind of acquiescence after 1872. Maybe that's about three men and women. In other words, they're the most aware, in a personal way, yeah. that these southern whites don't consent. Yes. Right. In other words, do they is the consent principle in their yeah. lexicon, or are they just so focused on freedom and equality that the consent part is not as highly ranked in their mind? Any sense of that? Yeah, at all? sure. So certainly, there's a wide range of expression, um, and certainly there are, um, you know, there are African Americans who petition and, and push for permanent alienation, or permanent disfranchisement. Um, but one of the interesting things to me is that even in states where there's a large, say, South Carolina, um, African-American majority in the Constitutional Convention, disfran Confederate disfranchisement has a hard time gaining a base in, new, in, in, in free people in the South. Where it's built in tends to be more where there's been white-on-white guerrilla -white warfare. Those people are willing to, white, you know, white loyalists who have fought against Confederate guerrillas in Arkansas, Missouri, they're willing to disfranchise, to disfranchise for periods or perhaps even forever um, rebels. Mm -hmm. African Americans, I mean, with some exceptions, um, but where you look at it at the Constitutional Convention level and at the legislative level, um, and what you can see then echoed in, you know, uh, in petitions and in, and in speeches, you see a large number of African Americans defending their access to, to the franchise um, as a universal manhood access to the franchise. Um, because they're interested in making sure that there's not a scenario where only soldiers are enfranchised, right? That if they make it solely on those grounds. Um, and so you see frequently there things that, um, you know, uh, that, that in retrospect, you know, will suggest how powerful this, this, this sort of problematic or this dilemma is, you know. If you enfranchise us, you can re re remove the army. Um, and then, but then, you know, immediately in the aftermath, you see that that's, that that's you know, not, um, that that, you know, that that, you know, uh, creates its own problems. There are certainly, some of that may be about the particularities of who's emerging as an African American leadership cohort at different phases. And one argument is that in these early constitutional conventions is the one place where you get this disproportionate number of previously freed people and northerners. Um, and so that it may be that that reflects some of that divergence. And that by 6970, where you see African American elected officials tend much more likely to have been um, enslaved before the war. So it may be a, that narrow sequence when disfranchisement was on the table um, about who's got a special say. Famously, in um, January, February 1865, in Savannah, Secretary of when Sherman takes Savannah at the end of the, end of the war, Secretary of War takes a boat down um, and meets, asks to meet with a group of the, the tens of thousands of, uh, of free people who have followed Sherman's army as they marched across Georgia, um, large part for fear of, of, of you know, this potential re-enslavement, right, as Confederate raiders came in behind him. Um, and so he has to meet with them. Um, and he asks them a question. Um, you know, there's <laughs> almost unanimity. There are a couple of pastors that end up uh, getting selected by the army and come meet with them. He asks a question. Uh, do you imagine your future, after talking about the nature of freedom, do you imagine your future as being intermixed, I'm not getting the words exactly right, intermixed among the white people, or living by yourself? 
And where there's unanimity in almost every other question that Stanton asked, here the first two speakers disagree. Uh, a pastor who had been enslaved before the war says, we will never be able to live among the white people. Right? They will always be at war with us. A pastor who had uh, been free and had operated a church, I think in Macon, maybe it was Augusta, says, you know, we can live among, you know, we can live among the whites if we've, if we've given, you know, if we're, if we're protected in our rights. And Stanton goes around and polls, and by 11 to 1, they agree with the first. Um, and so there is this theoretical, at least there's the potential that you can imagine a distinction, especially rural and slave plantation, being more wary of this than the people who emerge at the narrow moment of 67, 68. Um, but Hiram Revels was the first African American senator, argues for lifting disfranchisement um, and for lifting, uh, you know, supports amnesty. Um, so it's partly they're facing a political problem, which is once it's a set in motion, they say, you know, they're desperate to create enough alliances with a certain type of white political establishment that, you know, will be able to sustain a black Republican power base. And so at that point, then it's a practical more than an idealistic, than an ideal type question. Thank you. I just have another question, actually, about African American political thought. I was interested in the idea of you know, talking about stasis, about change and movement, right. uh, because actually, you know, when they, I mean, there is certainly a lot of people moving, actually, literally moving right at the end of the Civil War. But there's also, I've noticed, you know, looking at freedmen records, you actually see a lot of cases of what freed slaves really think freedom means is they don't have to move, right. um, and very much that you know, it's actually it's in some ways. Uh, seen as a very sort of Jeffersonian Republican idea of what freedom is. Freedom means I can stay right here, you know, and not have to leave anywhere, um, and that nobody can make me, you know, leave. This is my land. And, um, and of course, what's ironic about that, I think, is that it it actually is it, it's asking the federal government to actually embrace really radical policies to, to ever support that, far more radical than they're actually inclined to do. But I was just wondering what that would do to the, the idea that, you know, in some ways, the kind of what, what the freedmen really want here is that at least a lot of the significant portion of them really want is to, not, is to actually not have to forced to do much, you know, not to be forced to, they do want a kind of negative conception of, of freedom, at least if they're thinking of freedom, freedom from slave owners and freedom of, you know, I was wondering whether that would fit in your analysis. No, that's a really good question. And certainly there are um, avenues of that um, that you can see emerging during the war and, and immediately after of a conception of, if we can have this, you know, if, you'll, you know, if we can be protected in this, then we won't need to ask you for anything in the future. Um, that ends up breaking down in the post-war period because of practicalities, right? Um, the question of movement is a really interesting one because I think you can see elements of what you're talking about, especially upon claims, you know, uh, there are claims on land all over the place, including on, in areas that people had not lived before, right? So the land, I would say, you know, claim on the land is the sort of most profound desire, right? Um, and it would be even better, perhaps, if it were the land that you are on already, right? But the, but the, the claim on the land, you see claims on land both in pe uh, people in areas where they had lived and worked, but also in areas um, where they had not. Um, and, but you can also see, Litwack talks about that in this, this sort of shuffling, right? That in the face of the practical questions at the end of the war, that the common response he sees is of people who move from the plantation where they had worked to a neighboring plantation. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, a kind of different geography, right? A geography of, of area, you know, of a region, of a sub, you know, of a sub region, right? You know, five, ten miles away, places you can walk to. Being able to stay in communities near families, near extended families, near the burial grounds of their ancestors, that's really important. And yet, at the same time, leaving the over that freedom would mean leaving the oversight of the individual master, even if it meant taking a contract with somebody who had been a landlord who had been somebody else's master, right? So that there is this sort of interesting movement within movement within non-movement, and there's also this sort of you know in tracing out how to get back to sort of an originary you know to sort of you know essential beliefs versus responses to conditions is really hard. But the other thing that very much defines 65 and 66 is a movement to towns and cities and a particular movement to towns and cities that are garrisoned by US Army troops within that and a special movement to towns and cities that are garrisoned by USCT by black troops but also a movement to towns absent that um, to towns that are garrisoned by white troops in the absence of USCT troops. Um, and that that, you know, reflects, I think, this sort of weariness about what a negative freedom is actually going to look like in practice. <laughs>
over the course of the fall and winter of 65. Mm -hmm. I wonder what you would have to say about this. I think of American society as having, is based on political ideology, and I would define the Constitution as political ideology, but not political belief. Hmm. In other words, we've all we've got all this rhetoric, but if you just take the fact that slavery was enshrined in the Constitution, okay, so we've got this pavlum that we feed people instead of the government, governed, and that doesn't work. So I'm saying we don't have an underlying collective belief that reflects what the ideology says. I mean, certainly I think you can see huge gaps. I mean, I would, um, that's an interesting question. Let me, let me take a minute. Um, there's several ways in which I think you can see that gap uh, play out. Um, in that you can certainly see people who give very high-minded speeches about emancipation at the end of the war, but don't actually, you know, engage in, you know, the questions of what it would cost, right? You can, of, you know, what would actually be required. Um, you know, most sort of grotesquely, you see it in Andrew Johnson, you know, who says, you know, let me be your Moses, literally, right? But then restores land to, uh, to, southern, to southern whites over the late summer of 65. Um, and so at that level, um, there are all kinds of ways in which a kind of sense, am I getting your question right, a sense of sort of fundamental hypocrisy. Um, that you can see sort of even self <coughs> hypocrisy. I think at the same time that one of the things that structures um, this moment, though, is also a set of blindnesses. And then I think there are some other people who are truly trying to figure out how to deal with this question without ultimately overthrowing the nature of government or vacating state governments forever and always. And who might opportunistically, over-optimistically or naively say, here we've done it, right? Now here we're 1870, we'll make, you know, commissioners who can do this and that, and then we've solved it. And over-optimistically or naively believing they've reached a solution when they haven't. One of the interesting things to me is how many of those people, uh, fairly stodgy people, Matt Carpenter, you know, fairly moderate Republican, um, by, by late 1870, he says, if this isn't working, we're going to have to try something else. He's a constitutional lawyer, very able one. He says, but, you know, we're going to have to be willing to throw out the Constitution if this isn't working. Um, and that shocks people. Um, where I place then the ultimate betrayal um, is in the, uh, you know, I mean, you know, is, is in the, the, the voters, right? 1874, they elect the Democratic Congress, and then there's nothing anybody can and at that level, it stops becoming a test of people's ability to understand what the problem is and address it. And it starts becoming a desperate effort to preserve anything. The Democrats that are elected in 1874 don't pay the army. Um, and there's actually a series of constitutional crises where they refuse to, uh, to pay anyone in the army as a way of forcing the government to withdraw troops from the South. And in that end, in the Senate, where there remains a Republican majority, is desperately trying to figure out how to preserve anything. Um, so I would acknowledge certainly the role of a kind of hypocrisy in shaping certain actors and also say that at the same time there's also a level of human <coughs> frailty or what Albion Troget called foolishness, um, which is a sincere belief in an outcome without the rigor or discipline or foresight or luck to understand the steps that it would take to accomplish it. Is that respond to your question? Can I just push this a little sure. further? I think I'm also suggesting that among the general populace, right. there is no shared collective right. belief about right. what freedom is so that they are unable to practice it. Right. Well, that I think raises an interesting, you know, a, 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 a something that you can see playing out because I think it's been alluring. Um, to point toward, I mean, the you know, Republican Party has lots of problems in the 18, 1860s. It's been alluring to point toward moments of uh, weakness or compromise um, among the politicians. Um, but I do think that much more of the challenge lies at the level of public opinion. Um, and that when you watch the responses, that, you know, the public will support Republicans when Johnson or the Democrats behave exceptionally badly. But even Sherman says, uh, you know, 
He says, you know, we'll pass enfranchisement and we'll get a prize for it. Um, that in the end, sustaining, a, and, and you see this at the state level, um, that a series of states vote down the enfranchisement, um, and that that's one of the reasons, one of the things, the oddities of the 15th Amendment, that its practical impact is to enfranchise African Americans in the North. Um, and I think that level of public opinion, that you have a kind of vanguard, in my vision, revolutionary by, by the, by, 65 or 66, Republican Party atop a even northern public opinion that may be full of hatred toward those rebels, but but I would agree in large part seems much warier about these, uh, you know, about consistently supporting these transformations. <coughs> Certainly 74 in the Democratic tidal wave, you really see a very small reservoir of hardcore Republican districts in the world. What happens to conceptions of freedom in the white South? Um, well, as far as like spatial metaphors, it wouldn't make sense that they're trying to reach freedom because they, they had it. And as far as like temporal metaphors, they, they can't wait for it to come because they lost it. And then um, they, they surely don't trust the state or state yeah. promises. So like what happens to, because freedom is a rallying cry for Absolutely. Confederates. So what kind of happens in the decades after the Civil War? So I don't go to Brazil. To go Cuba, Brazil, um, you know that especially the idea of uh, if freedom is the right to own slaves, um, you know that you do see that's relatively small, small movements, but you do see that. Um, that's a really good question. Um, you see the embrace of what had been a uh, you know a, a democratic idea from the 1850s, um, and that you see emerge. Um, I would say more strongly in the in the 1860s after the war, which is of homogeneity. That freedom means the ability to exert uh, heterogeneity. Uh, that freedom means the ability to exert authority where you are without intervention. And that especially as they become confident that in areas except for the Low Country and the heart of the of the Delta, that they are able to exert to you know regain local authority. That this assertion of freedom and local authority. I think actually becomes much stronger in the aftermath of the Civil War than it was before. I think before the Civil War, many of them thought they were going to, you know, retain control of the federal government. Um, and that after the Civil War, this sense, you know, that it started as the Douglas, I think, as the, you know, Stephen Douglas is the first one who really popularizes the idea of heterogeneity. Um, and that you really see this movement toward that idea that freedom means um, a willingness of the national state to, to, to step away. In that sense, I think that sort of pure abstract defense of localism may actually be stronger after the war than before. Well, in a certain sense, they go to war. The, 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 the white South go, you know, engages in a struggle to, to redeem their governments. You're talking about after, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So they're, they're, you know, what do they do? Well, they, you know, what is their teleology? They're, they are, in some measure, you know, uh, in armed conflict, in the state of war, to, to, uh, to uh, restore their understanding of local authority. Uh, but I think uh, Professor Down's point is well taken that in that 30 year period before the outbreak of the Civil War, the Democratic Party nationally is dominant, and the slave owning class has a it, it, it likes the influence it has via the Supreme <laughs> Court and the Congress and so on over the nation as a whole to promote and protect slavery. And then that's no longer on the table. And so they become a, this different kind of uh, point of view about what the federal government is and ought to be. And I assume the African, the freed population becomes the ultimate, their anti-federal government pre-Civil War, to the extent they think about it, the African, in other words, the federal government is more, is the, the Fugitive Slave Act people and so on. But after the Civil War, presumably they become among the most enthusiastic about the federal government because in theory it's supposed to protect them from these forces of localism that are attempting to re-enslave them. And certainly you see during the war and after, and, and actually before the war, you can see um, at least, you know, preserves if you read through the way that, you know, uh, the planters talk about what they, you know, what what slaves are talking about, and if you read memoirs that provide a retrospective glance. I mean, certainly there's a high degree of awareness, it seems like, of the development of a northern anti-slavery politics. And that in certain areas, as early as 48, you can see people plugging into, you know, you can see examples, at least retrospectively, of slaves saying that at that time we were debating, you know, talking about this shift. Certainly by Fremont in 56, I think that there's a, 
understanding, it may actually, understanding may be the wrong word, there's a fantasy that a Republican Party is more committed to, to direct end of slavery than it actually is, but there's an attachment to that. So in the degree that, I mean, to one of the things, so that you can certainly see the premises of it, um, you know, that if the imagination is that a Republican Party is going to be able to use the federal state for this, once they gain the state, then whatever suspicion of the federal government, in some sense, will disappear as the actors. It sort of goes back to that old question of a party state that Ben and Skaronica talked about, that very few people seem to have clear, um, non, uh, you know, clear and coherent visions of the government. They have a clear and cohesion, coherent vision of their party, right? You know, and, and in that sense, the roots of a kind of capital R state, Republican statism, and free people, you can really see emerging in the 1850s, even before emancipation. And then there's really a, uh, a, you know, that's one of the reasons why the movements and the actions during the war are so quick and then so cohesive, why people are able to build such a cohesive movement as a part, because you know, I think now I have much more of a sense of how active those debates and that political community formation was. But you're right in the big sense that the Republicans love pointing out to the Democrats, you know, who developed the federal, you know, federal commissioner power. It was the Democrats. Why? To protect slavery and to, to do the fugitive slave clause. Um, and they delight in 66 and 70 in picking up all of those forms of federal state expansion that the Democrats had passed and seeing if they can invert them um, and to turn them toward a defense not of slavery but of civil rights. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is the degree to how that form actually is a limiting form that disappoints, though, you know, maybe not so much, but disappoints both pro-slavery Democrats and anti-slavery Republicans, that the commission form of federal government, which is the only one they can sort of imagine themselves into, is inherently disappointing to whoever's operating it, no matter what their ideological ends. But I could be wrong on that. I'm, I'm, uh trying to take something away from my, this conversation. <laughs> I guess what's problematic for me right now, I'm hearing on the one hand that the question of freedom was paramount before the Civil War, right. and it remained so after the war. Right. So what then, how would you frame the importance or significance of the Civil War in American history? Right, absolutely. Um, that's, that's the ultimate question, right? So on the level of freedom, I would say that there's nothing about the Civil War that is, the Civil War is not the place where people learn about freedom or learn to, you know, learn to desire freedom. I think that that's, you know, uh, you know deeply held, um, I wouldn't get into whether it's inherent in the human condition or it's inherent in a, you know, you know it's inherent by the early modern period to want, um, and it's certainly going to be inherent in these, in these revolutionary states set up in the, in the late 18th and 19th century. Um, so that debates about what freedom would mean and why freedom is desirable, widespread, um, you, know, uh, you know, you see in response to the Haitian Revolution, you see evidence of white <coughs> slaves talking about it. And so there's nothing, the Civil War has, you know, little impact upon that ideological development. The impact it has is that it becomes the place of recognition. And I would argue that that recognition is important to the free people themselves because they understand um, the limits of self-claim freedom for anyone, but especially for, um, you know, especially for enslaved people in the 1850s or prior to the Civil War. So that the impact of a recognition and the content of what would be recognized and not be recognized, which is going to be different than potential other contents of what would be recognized or our contemporary contents, I would say that that's actually extremely important. Um, the freedom that emerges is more limited than what um, you know, various people, especially but not solely free people, wanted. But it does have a content, um, and that that content is, the, is in part a reflection of this dynamic interplay of claims made to the government, often but not solely through the army, about denials of content of freedom, about a working through um, you know, at levels high and low about what freedom would mean and about, you know, in 6670 Civil Rights Act, 14th Amendment, efforts to claim certain pieces of freedom that wouldn't be withdrawn. Some of those are, but some of those are not, right? The ability to sue, the ability to testify, these are meager compared to what people wanted, but some of that 
ability to call for recognition of the status of freedom will survive even through Jim Crow. And I do think that if there had not, it's easy to imagine, let's say that if there had been acquiescence to um, the black codes that the 1865 governments passed, it's easy to imagine um, not only, uh, it's easy to, if that had been, been acquiescence to that, it's easy to imagine a constrained vision of freedom by the 80s and 90s that's even more constrained than what will come into Jim Crow, right? But there's, there's, the successful line of defense is small, but it's not zero, right? And that it is about these lawyers' emphasis upon access to courts. I want to just kind of pop things up to a slightly more meta level, if I could. Um, and I mean, it's not meta, in, not meta in the sense that, that Eric would like us, but it's meta, <laughs> it's meta in the sense of you're going to you teach you teach the survey. Um, so how do you, how does what you you know how, how you you worked on last ten years on on reconstruction? Um, I, I'll, I'll point <coughs> to Gersel draws his line at 1933. Um, Faye Scottsball similarly says. The Civil War had no impact on the rise of a big government, big state. Uh, that, that the um, and she focuses on the, uh, the compensation for union widows and orphans, and saying this was just simply something to do with, with services rendered, and it was not. There was no influence of the large state. But have you change. You, you know, how do you think big from an arc that runs from you know John Quincy Adams in 19, 1825 suggesting a large state to to you know the end of the Second World War. I mean, what what? How do you how do you cover? How do you situate your story in that time frame of the of the of the rise of the American state? Right. That's a good question. I, I mean, one thing is I don't like that phrase um, because I don't think of a graph you know of that graph working so much that there is a teleology built within that. And I think within those terms, if you want to say. When do we get a recognizable 20th century state, and then you answer it in the 20th century? That's fair enough, but it's not interesting, right? I mean, I don't think it's interesting, right? So certainly, um, you know, that's fine, but that's just sort of running in a circle. I think that state development, you know, in most places, and it's not surprising that it's true in the United States too, is much more haphazard than that, and much less, um, you know, and, and much less, you know, smooth. So I would say that you know the Civil War injects interest in and exploration of a large national, which is the crucial question, right? That they you know they're interested, they're aware of Novak's right, you know, local state power, you know, well before, but an interest in large national interventions um, and, a, and an interest in <coughs> understanding what's possible, um, and that that lasts for a time. It has certain embedded, distinct, you know, embedded changes it makes within the structure of government, and certain that don't last. And then other things happen. Um, and so, in that sense, I don't, I don't want to argue it is the tail of, you know, you know, the, yeah. that what we need to do is we've got, you know, progressive, you know, so and so's got, you know, New Deal to 1960s. Somebody else says no, it's progressive New Deal 1960s. I think it's Reconstruction, progressive New Deal 1960s, because I don't think that makes any sense. I'm much more interested in. Um, the questions of, I'm much more interested in the breaks and the gaps than in that kind of smoothing out. But the, that being said, I, there is a trajectory ultimately of some kind. And I'm, 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 I must admit, I'm sitting here thinking about other, uh, setting aside the, the fundamental questions of freedom that we've, we've been focusing on here, I thought of the wider, I'm sort of ratcheting back to other issues that do lead toward more uh, larger intervention. I, I think of the um, another event in 1906, uh, the city of San Francisco burned to the ground after a massive earthquake, and they immediately mobilized the U.S. Army uh, without any question, boom, and they, um, they uh, you know, occupied the city. And, and uh, this did not happen in the Mississippi Valley during the floods of, of 1927, but according to the guy who's written about the floods in the Mississippi Valley, uh, did that it shocked the nation that they didn't. You know, you know, so anyway, what, I, what I'm driving at is, is I, I, keep, I keep thinking about the part of my kind of larger global thing. Um, the mid 19th century sees a lot of crises, and some people who've talked about it in terms of cities talk about it as a, as a the urban environmental crisis of, of, the, of the mid century. That um, and the Civil War can be seen as as a gigantic you know environmental social crisis which creates the, the need for action. 
Uh, and, but the other, the other kind of place that needs uh, action, Boston burns the ground. Chicago burns the ground. Uh, huge urban fires that that uh, require rethinking of the shape of government on the ground. And what, what people are calling the silent revolution of government that has to do with public health. So I'm just wondering about how we, whether we can, whether the gaps that you're talking, the breakages, the, uh, there are also things that fill, you know, the, yeah. that are part of that late 19th century story that are the construction of a, of the infrastructure of, a, of governance that is really very, very different than it was in 1850. I would agree with that. Um, you know, I think that there's no question that the, what both Republicans and Democrats express anxiety of, the militarization of government, um, define, goes well past reconstruction and doesn't only involve um, southern issues, not just in the West. But if you do something like the 7th Cavalry, which goes from, you know, the 1870s, goes from the Plains stationed in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, to put down the Klan in a state that had never been at war with the United States, right? Which is a, an entirely new expression of peace powers. Uh, goes from there to Chicago during the fire. Uh, goes back to Kentucky to uh, put down the Klan. Circles back and ends up in Indian Wars. And there are elements at which you can point to an antebellum precedence for all kinds of those things. But the idea that the army is going to be one of the tools that's immediately at hand, I think that the war, the increased power of, uh, you know, of Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, of these people who are interested in using the army, does make it a tool. It's a tool, the reason why I wouldn't say and therefore you can trace is that it's a tool Democrats really fight to eviscerate and over time yeah. do, you know, reduce the numbers, reduce the legal authority. When they go to Chicago, they're not invited in by the governor, and that's a huge deal, right? They're in a, they're in a, in a, in a, in a, in a city at peace uh, with an army intervention. Um, and that really is, uh, you know, is a viola it would, that's a violation of, of pre-war norms. I think the other thing that you can certainly see is that the emergence of a set of, that emancipation becomes a field upon which one of the, you know, you know Richard White says the West is the kindergarten of the American state, and that may be true, um, but, you know, pre-kindergarten might be the, you know, wartime American South, or first grade, depending on when you want to, talk, when you assume that he's, what, what time period do you assume he's talking about the West? Um, because those circuits of intervention, some of which are people moving back and forth between directly part of a government structure toward part of a reform that's working in hand in hand with the government structure to a reform separated from reform movement separated from the government structure to lobbyists um, on things like interventions in public health, which in the wartime in the South and the post-war period were very high, going back to you know Butler, you know uh, breaking you know breaking the cycle of malaria in New Orleans. Um, <coughs> And that becomes a project, but a failed project, right, to embed a federal department of education, clearly emerges from the southern experience, transported west, transported back into the party, um, and this effort to do, have they won, then I think it would be safer ground to say, and here's this smooth trajectory. But a lot of these ideas and goals exist, but many of them don't fully come to fruition. Well, there's the difference between institutionalization and, and the creation of expectations. Right. So I think you've Established, I think, in all everything you said, the, the, expect, the, the unmet expectations are, right. are created and right. are, are emerging, and and the the understanding that things can happen. You know, the Democrats constantly push back and right. throw, but, but uh, uh, I think the, the distinction between institutionalization versus the, the, the creation of expectations is interesting, uh, and that's a central central. Theme. What do we want to do? Further questions? I think we should put our hands together. <laughs>